Hi, Venkat. Hi, you... good morning, Sambit. Good morning. Can you see How me? How are you doing? I'm doing well. Hi, Venkat. Hi, Mohammed. Good morning. Morning. Tushar, good morning. Good Hello, good morning, morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. So, let's. Uh, do we have more uh, panel members to join? No, I guess uh, five of us. All excited, I guess. I, I only <laughs> do three. Okay. <laughs> okay. We are excited. Yeah. Like, okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Gopi. Now I see everyone here in the playlist. So let's uh, get started and and. Um, I, I will uh, start with a quick, uh, uh, you know, overview of the, you know, very exciting and, and very interesting uh, panel discussion we have today morning. See, um, the artificial intelligence applications, right? They need a lot of computing and memory. So there is a continuous debate on what is the best way to process AI workloads, whether we do it in cloud or edge. Cloud or edge. Cloud computing. Cloud computing. Okay, I'm getting a re-sound here. Cloud computing means using remote servers or data centers for storing, processing, computing, and analyzing massive amounts of data. And panel discussion will focus on challenges and the best solutions. So I like to introduce our chair for the panel discussion, Mr. Sambit Sahu. And Sambit will in turn be introducing the other panel members. Sambit is currently working at Intel Bangalore and he is the VP and GM of IoT and high velocity silicon and platform engineering group. And his group is spread across the globe at Intel Corporation. Sambit has been in the semiconductor industry close to 30 years and Sambit has held a number of technical and leadership positions in multiple areas of SOC design. He led teams delivering dozens of products in various market segments, including smartphones, modems, IoT devices, small cell products, and intelligent routers. Before joining Intel in 2016, Sahu worked at Qualcomm as a vice president of engineering at uh, their Bangalore Design Center. Sambit spent close to 13 years in US before moving back to Bangalore. And he started his career at Intel and worked at other companies like Sun Microsystems, Rocket Networks as well. Sambit has broad experience in EDA tool development, IP development, and large SOCs. Sambit earned his bachelor's degree in electronics and telecommunications from the University College of Engineering, Barla, and master's degree in computer engineering from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. So I request Sambit to kick off the panel discussion. Thank you, Sambit. Hey, thank you, Venkata, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all the people worldwide. Uh, very excited uh, to be part of this uh, panel discussion, age versus cloud. And Venkata, as you said, this is a continuous debate and this will continue for some more time. And uh, uh, I would like to take this privilege to introduce the very illustrious panelists. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Tusar Kant a co-founder, Global IIT Artificial and Machine Learning Forum. Tushar has more than 20 years of industry experience across Silicon Valley and Wall Street at Amazon Web Services, VMware, Facebook, Intel Corporation, Sun Microsystems, Bank of America Securities, and G Capital. He has worked in diverse fields spanning across product management, software development, investment banking, private equity and venture capital. Tushar has a BS in electrical engineering from IIT, MS in computer science from US and MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. He has publications in artificial intelligence, high performance algorithms and bankruptcy and reorganization. 
welcome tushar to the panel next Thank i would you, like Sambit. sure welcome very warm welcome the next uh, panelist i would like to introduce is uh, professor mohammad sabri mohammad m sabri alai is an assistant professor at nanyang technological university singapore and the founder of emas he received his phd degree in electrical and computer engineering from ecole polytechnique federale de lausanne in 2013 he was a post doctoral research fellow at stanford university from 2014 till 2017 his current research interest includes system level design and optimization of computing systems enabled by emerging technologies with particular emphasis on computing systems for artificial intelligence his work on system level analysis on data centric emerging systems has led to a 75 million us dollar darpa program he is currently the program manager of the singapore flagship ame programmatic project which is a hardware software co optimized for deep learning he is an active close collaborator with top industrial and academic partners such as stanford university tsmc and samsung Dr. Alai is a senior IEEE member and he is a recipient of the Swiss National Science Foundation Early Postdoctoral Mobility Fellowship in 2013. Welcome, Professor Mahmud, to this panel. Thank, thanks, Samit, for that kind introduction. Thank you so much. You're Thank very you. warm welcome. Uh, next, uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Kavita Prasad. Kavita. Uh, is the vice president of business development and systems application at sima.ai through close collaboration with customers and partners kavita is responsible for defining the system level architecture for sima ai's machine learning soc she has experience across system applications system architecture business development and engineering to deliver ai and machine learning solutions to computer vision platforms in smart vision robotics and autonomous systems and automotive markets she is a technology leader with over 22 years of experience in delivering multiple successful products in asics socs fpgas and servers across multiple process nodes prior to sima.ai Kavita was responsible for system solutions across embedded market segments for the Intel Platform Solutions Group, among other positions in Intel. Prior to Intel, she held multiple technology roles at Xilinx and Philips. Kavita holds a Master's of Science in Electrical Electronics Engineering from San Jose State University. Welcome, Kavita, to the panel. Thanks Thank a lot, Sambit. Thanks for the introduction. Very warm welcome. And last but not the least. I'd like to introduce uh, Gopi Shinani. Gopi Shinani is the CEO of Axiado and a Silicon Valley veteran with over 25 years of experience in the semiconductor software and systems industries from companies like Qualcomm, Marvel and Applied Micro. As a senior executive, he has demonstrated exceptional skill at building highly efficient cost-effective organizations managing rapidly changing environments and bringing industry changing technologies to market welcome gopi thank you sambe thank you for introduction sir hi okay great uh, and uh, uh, like to take this occasion to thank aisa for really giving us this opportunity to do this panel and uh, like to request the audience to post their very exciting or challenging questions for this panel uh, we will uh, reserve last 15 minutes to take on the audience questions so please keep posting and uh, with that uh, i will just uh, introduce this topic and uh, i will let uh, the panelists uh, uh, jump into it and have a very good debate so uh, as all of us uh, you know probably all ramping up and probably very excited about this ai growth this is the biggest uh, revolution that is happening as we speak i think the biggest revolution i have seen in my 30 years of my uh, life is pretty much uh, touching every aspect of our lives uh, uh, it's so big and uh, the good thing is that it has its 
it's infancy of the revolution. I mean, next 30 years, well, people will all be speaking about AI, AI, and AI. And today, as, of, as far as I know, practically every technology company is investing a lot of their effort and energy into this AI growth. And uh, according to market research, uh, this combination of AI, IoT, and 5G or next generation communication technologies is supposed to trigger a $17 trillion, $17 trillion economy worldwide. I mean, that's the magnitude of this AI. And this AI, uh, you know, it has four aspects. I mean, that's what today's AI may evolve later on. You know, it has four aspects. One is uh, how do we ingest meaningful data for AI processing? You know, uh, there's so much of data and how do we get uh, uh, meaningful data? The second is how do we use the data to train and generate a good model? The third piece is that once you have the model, then how do you infer uh, and get some intelligence? There's the inference piece. And the fourth piece is actions based upon that inference. So these four pieces. And this AI requires a lot of processing, requires entire systems to be built, a lot of innovations to happen, lot of technologies to be built and a lot of aspects like security, privacy, ethics, uh, you know, all kinds of things. And the other phenomenon that is happening is traditionally we have taken data to the compute. We have taken data to the compute, but in this AI world, we have to bring compute to the data. We have to bring compute closer to the data. Now, to do this AI, there are three significant paradigms. One is your end devices, end devices like your sensors and actuators, your smartphones, your wearables, which is very close to the data, but they have very limited processing capability. On the other side of the spectrum, there is a cloud, which has huge computing capacity, which is, but it's farther away from the data. And a, you know, may not be suitable for mission critical, latency critical applications. So now something called edge is evolving, which is between these end devices and the cloud. And this edge is supposed to bridge the gap that exists between the end devices and the cloud. Today, you know, end devices, is a no-brainer. We need end devices. We need things to sense. We need things to act in a limited way. Okay. But the debate is about whether it is for the future, whether it's going to be cloud, it's going to be edge, it's going to be both. What is it going to be? What is that going to be that will revolutionize this AI for the next 30 years? That is going to provide the quality of service, that's going to improve our lives. That's the debate. And with that, I'll open up the panel for discussion and their perspectives. I'll start first with uh, uh, the order that I went through the introduction. I'll start with uh, Mr. Tusar Khan. So, uh, Sambet, thanks. Go ahead. Yes. So, what are your perspectives about this cloud versus edge? And what do you think will be the future? Is it going to be cloud only, edge only, or a combination? And why so? Right. First of all, Sam, uh, Sambeth, you know, good overview of the overall topic. And, you know, right now the way we stand, uh, it's a combination of cloud and edge, right? Good part of training for the models, one of the five steps you said happens in the cloud typically. And, you know, a lot of inference happens at the edge. The interesting part is, you know, there's a lot of companies, including some of them which are sponsoring this conference, like Qualcomm, who spent a lot of money trying to build technologies for the edge. On the other hand, you have companies like Xilinx, which is again a sponsor for this conference, which builds FPGAs, which are bought by cloud providers, which is used for model training, right? Along with GPUs from NVIDIA, you know, Intel CPUs, uh, Altera FPGAs. Now, one interesting paradigm which is happening is with a lot of data getting generated at the edge, uh, you know, good part of inference and maybe some training or what is called federated learning may happen at the edge 
where you basically have models getting trained or getting updated at least at the edge. So what is preventing from edge to be very, uh, really robust or very active right now? Two things, compute power at the edge and the network bandwidth speed between edge and the cloud. So let's see how that is going to transform over the next five to 10 years. The compute power at the edge is improving slowly and slowly with new processes coming in, better capabilities coming in. And the network bandwidth is going to go through a revolution through 5G. So the combination of 5G and improvement in compute capacity at the edge will change the dynamics. So there are some underlying technology forces which is going to change the dynamics to some extent where it would be still a combination of cloud and edge. We'll still have centralized training of models in the cloud, but we'll have much more federated learning, federated uh, you know, training of models at the edge. Inference will become better. And that's the way it's going to evolve over a period of time. So that's what my, uh, what you can say, an opening gambit in terms of how, how I feel systems are going to evolve and why they're going to evolve that way. Thank you. Excellent, Tushar, a really great perspective. And uh, I'll now go to Professor Mohammed with the same question. What are your perspectives of cloud versus edge? What will be the future? Cloud only, edge only, combination, why so? Right. Okay, thanks, Amit, for and, and Tushar gives actually been a very concise uh, answer to this question, but let me try to see if I can add uh, to his really succinct answer. So there are aspects in the cloud that you will not find in the edge. Uh, which is basically you have the ability to collect data from like millions and trillions of these devices. That surpasses a lot. So there will be uh, use cases that the cloud will always win, which is basically in training really sophisticated data. And also when the cases like you have models that are very large. So if we look at mean language translation models and all that, uh, they require parameters in terms of billions. So talk about like gigabytes of memory just to load the model itself, not to perform computation. So this is a place where the cloud would still have an edge for the next five years. Uh, the cloud, sorry, yeah, have, have an edge over the edge, yeah. So if you look at the other side, right, if, if we're trying to apply now, where an edge is benefiting nowadays is actually in infinite learning and in inference more often than that. What is limiting nowadays that, that the edge takes full-blown power, right, is that you cannot really run really sophisticated models on it, right? And the reason there are two things. One, you are mostly limited by the battery power, right? So you cannot really put processors with high performance, right? Because they will just deplete your battery in no time. The second, even if you put that, your problem will be also in memory. So if you, you cannot really put large amounts of SRAM, you cannot put really large amounts of DRAM, if this I mean foot, small footprint, so you're gonna be limited with flash and flash is slow, so you're gonna be hurting the performance. And the idea of putting inference at the edge is not functionality, but actually more in latency sensitive operations. So for example, you're doing autonomous driving, um, you don't want to be sending your video feed right through an unrobust network, and then when the detection comes, it's too late to detect a pedestrian and you already have an accident that's happening there. So, so for now, so there's a fundamental problem in how to really unlock this true potential of the edge. So to find the, the solution to make the edge really achieve its full potential would be um, in innovations across the software and the hardware stack. So in the software, like the models that we have right now, if you look at the progression in time, Previously, models would be like in hundreds of millions, right? For let's say for image classifications. Now it's been dropped significantly to a couple of million parameters. So in time, you will be able to get this down to a really, really small networks that can do really sophisticated things. So that will take its time. And you want your software to do not just simple image classification, actually do even more sophisticated aspects and become more efficient in doing so. So that part, but also you want the technology support to help you with that. And this is where it comes in like really new cutting edge devices for processing logic and for storage and for integration. You need to work on the three aspects. If you see the foundries that nowadays they're pushing like with Moore's Law is running its course, we're talking about three nanometer coming up very soon. And then people are asking what's next, right? They're looking into aspects of 3D integration. How can we increase the footprint? We're looking into how can we get uh, some of these really fast non-volatile memory, right? So it plays an, a nice, gap between the DRAM and flash, something of that sort. We have seen the Intel obtain DIMMs, I mean the cross 3D cross point, but they're trying to get it on chips for edge devices. Um, you're looking at also like for some people look into like what kind of logic devices that we can use apart from Silicon CMOS that can bring in like more performance at the same power budget. 
So once you be doing all this, right, the edge device would be um, unlocked and then you will be able to do a lot of more sophisticated applications there. You will be sending more even relevant information for the cloud. So that makes the models on the cloud even more sophisticated, right? Because now they're dealing with not just with raw data, they're dealing with processed information that you can even they get deeper insights if I'm having trillions of these sensors together. With the help of the network, the whole cycle of doing inference at the edge, sending it to the cloud, getting an update of the cloud, sending it back to the edge, getting more insights will be much faster than it is nowadays. So I'm still, um, I'm agreeing with Tushar on that front that it will be uh, cloud and edge, but we will see more of the edge than we see more of the cloud in the upcoming years. I see. Great, great insight, uh, Professor Mohammed. Uh, uh, now, Kavita, I, what's your perspective on this uh, cloud versus edge, and what's the future? I do agree with Professor Mohammed and uh, Tushar a lot. Uh, I think I do. Uh, I do agree with their perspective. Uh, but let me add my spin to it. Um, if you look, if we look at the AI landscape today, training uh, to a large extent is a very well understood problem, and to a great extent is a solved problem. But when you look at inference, it's not there yet. Deploying the trained models at an application level is more than just running one benchmark and publishing the KPIs. It's the combination of trained models, one or many, running together concurrently or serially with other application logic like pre-processing and post-processing to make it a holistic application. It could now be a computer vision application or it could be recommendation systems. And now with also the advent of 5G and the number of sensors that are being deployed in the market and also the smart devices that are being deployed worldwide, the amount of raw data that is being generated is vast, actually nearly almost zettabytes worth. Now imagine sending all this data to the cloud to do some compute and get meaningful analytics out of it. I do see some problems, significant challenges with this. One, this is going to be expensive connectivity, storage, infrastructure, all that is going to cost. Two, some of these applications are latency sensitive and safety critical. By the time you send this data to the cloud to process, analyze, decide and communicate, com uh, compute and communicate back to the remote locations, the ground truth could have just changed. So wh whatever actions you wanna take on the ground truth is no longer valid. Three, and some of these remote applications like say oil rigs or you're in battlefield, they, they may not even have the connectivity to send the data to the cloud. What will happen then? They have to collect all the data and then they have to go to a base station where there's connectivity available and then download that data for analytics. So if you want to do any predictive analytics or any real-time applications and real-time decisions, that makes it impossible. So if you ask me what is the right answer, cloud or edge, I think the answer is simply both. Like for example, there are certain tasks that are very well suited, say like training or running power hungry workloads or like Professor Mohammed said, they are workloads that require lots of diverse data from multiple uh, sensors, like say for example, genomics or non-latency critical workloads. That's where cloud will continue to play a huge role because we get flexibility, scalability and general purpose compute to run large models. But then there are other certain tasks that are well suited for edge, say autonomous driving, drones or re-identification, which are latency critical tasks where the decision needs to be made locally and only high fidelity data based on those decisions get sent back to the cloud where you can do more analysis to create a continual learning loop as the cl cloud can now fine tune these trained models based on the new set of data. So with edge getting uh, immediate data, with edge we get immediate data processing, security and privacy and better customer experience. But having said this uh, some bit, uh, what I really see is that there are many challenges today in deploying trained models to edge devices. The number of models that are getting generated today using various frameworks is only exponentially increasing. And also the different kinds of edge devices are also growing. Now deploying these trained models from the edge seamlessly on various hardware platforms is not an easy task and it may lead to performance degradation, productivity hits and also portability issues. And that's where I see a lot of these industry, uh, uh, well-known companies in the industry like AW, uh, Amazon uh, Web Services or NVIDIA or Microsoft, they are pivoting to creating a seamless path from training in the cloud to deploying at the edge. 
And that's where frameworks like TVM are also helping with optimizing and auto-tuning these trained models before deploying them on the edge devices. So how do I see the AI landscape playing out? I think cloud and edge will have their own roles to play in AI. They are going to be complementing each other. Cloud has scalability and flexibility. And for latency sensitive and safety applications, edge will play a huge role. Exponential growth of um, sensors will necessitate moving a lot of these workloads to the edge. And the key for any of this to succeed will be to build a seamless integration infrastructure where trained models from the cloud can be easily deployed on the edge and meaningful data from the edge gets sent back to the cloud to enable fine tuning of the learned models. So creating a continual training and inference loop. So that is my view of how this whole AI is going to play out in the near future, Samit. Excellent, uh, excellent perspectives, Kavita. Very nice. And uh, now I'll move to Gopi. Uh, Gopi, the same question. What are your perspectives? I have got three agrees. I hope you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need we need an opposition for a functioning democracy in both India and US are democracy. So. <laughs> okay. Go so ahead. not I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to be just just for the sake of the changing the other party. That's not the case anyway. <laughs> but as everybody explained, I'll be short. I think you guys covered mostly already. We don't need to repeat any of that. I think it's going to coexist. But let me give you the little bit different perspective of what uh, what we work on. Right? Everybody so far talked about, and pretty much the world talked about, AI means it's nothing but a computer vision base. Everything is a vision picture. In inferences are based on that, how much fast you can do it, and all the examples, how the presenters talked about. What I've been doing almost my career is, uh, whether you call this is today the AI or not, it's uh, technically word AI is just decision making and all that rather than just a computer vision base. So I'll give an example of previous company and I'll tell you based on that how this combo works. Uh, Qualcomm, if you're, if you're using a Wi-Fi mesh, that is, if it doesn't work, you can blame me. That's my brainchild to do it. And uh, you know, if it works, okay, thank you. Uh, but when we started doing this, you know, it was a simple router at home. People were paying 100 bucks. That's good enough to be working, uh, even sometimes with 20 bucks. But the word of what just Kavita talked about, right? By the time the decision goes to cloud and come back, an enterprise AP, an access point deployed to the world, and mostly something called spectral analysis means you had to be able to survey that how many clients are out there already and what channels are they sitting there, which channels are open for me. So we assign the you know, particular user. That's why in olden days compared to the home network Wi-Fi versus the cloud uh, enterprise-based network would work better because that's a managed one. So he's managing to the cloud. But the problem is if you have a 100,000 people at a train station, there's no way the model is gonna go to the cloud and be able to do by the time the guy moves coming out of the train, like take a VT station, people coming out of the station, everybody's phone is gonna start connecting to that AP trying to figure out and you got all the channels are already gone. By the time you decided, everybody's gone. So that's never gonna work that way. So he has to be able to do, that's what the distributor Wi-Fi, which is a mesh today, means everybody at their own, and you had to be able to cover in own proximity of that. And then all you need to know is exactly around you. That means the, the, you take a six diagonals or a four diagonals, however you're gonna take it. All you need to be aware of those six and then you cover this and then hand over to them. And then all this is kind of mushroom out to be and all this data collected to the cloud, as everybody said, we can take the models on the cloud to try to say, okay, what is the default is gonna look like? That starts with, but it's self-training is mostly gonna work. Um, that, that is the biggest one to do. I, I agree with Kavita, there's a lot of models need to happen. This is an exponential. I'm actually inserting something. There is a zero models exist today which is everybody worked on all, all universities worked only on a computer vision base. Nobody worked on a network element, network element base. It is, we had to build from ground up, literally every packet we need to be able to build. So hopefully that will also in a way it comes up and then we'll be able to make. Maybe the next round I'll talk about security and all that stuff, but uh, at an agreement for me is saying that it is gonna be collection of data has to happen on the edge. Some local decisions has to be done. Uh, compute powers, I don't know whether I agree that it's not there enough. Battery is not the edges we're talking about. That's not a tiny AI or tiny ML. We're talking about a little bit bigger. The edge we're talking about are power boxes. So when you say power boxes, computing is exponentially increasing, including Kavita's company is also doing that. So a lot of people, once upon a time, dual core, you know, quad core CPUs or 
you know, that's greatest, biggest thing is our PC. Your phones are bigger than that now. And every end devices in one of the Belize or whatever the company was showing a small packet. That must we have a hundred and thousand cores in there. So it will be, compute is coming to the end. And I think somebody, you said that too also. And I, with that, I believe a lot more data additions has to happen local. Doesn't matter 5G connectivity or 100 gig connectivity comes up. You still need to be able to, you will be exploring that data. So it'll coexist, but I think we're all saying same thing. Bigger models has to go cloud and then maybe initial models comes from the cloud. Okay. Excellent, uh, excellent. Uh, I think uh, somewhat there is consensus that uh, both uh, cloud and edge will coexist for the, at least the next uh, few years that we can envision right now. And uh, there needs to be a lot more action, a lot more innovations on the edge as I see because of the latency, the security, the quality of service, a uh, lot more innovations to be done there. And uh, yes, we are all uh, riding this very exciting journey, uh, which is going to be there for the next 30 years. And uh, with that, I, I will uh, jump to my uh, next uh, question. Um, uh, because so many companies are innovating every aspect of this whole AI thing, edge, cloud, sensors, everything. I mean, I read some literature that um, uh, the amount of uh, compute that AI needs is uh, the demand is doubling every four months, whereas your Moore's law can deliver double the compute uh, every two years. Uh, that's a huge gap. Uh, uh, and that gap I don't see coming down anytime soon with the uh, explosive AI growth. So my next question will be, what are the top two or three disruptive or really big technologies that we should all be investing into, you know? Uh, what are those really? I heard things like federated learning. Uh, I heard explosion of uh, sensors. What are the three top few big areas that we should be investing into? We, we, we can, can start with anybody uh, and then- I can see can, the first thing. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'll, maybe I start talking, so okay. Yes, please. Uh, I, I can start saying the biggest thing is ignored in the market right now is the security. That's why our company started working on. So it doesn't matter whatever, the, whatever you're talking about, whether it's a cloud or edge, there's a lots of lots of data. Okay? You know, some other critical data, some are health data we're talking about, personal data, is there biometrics itself, is there banks, finances, everything. I mean, my brand, grandfather has to now forcefully do online banking. He doesn't even know what that means. Okay? And people can you know, steal his keys, words, all it needs is a, they are so much, so much sophisticated that just a link comes up, you just need to click it enough to for his authentication. That's enough. The one weakest link comes to the whole bank is opened up for the guys to do it. So what I think innovation need to happen in security, what we are doing in a piece, I can tell you, uh, you know, I can give you an example, all this cloud so-called zero trust has an example is something like a badge. You have this badge, you see all this white badge. There's a small number in here, it's assigned to Gopi, but even if you put a biggest security guard in, in front of the building, all he cares about is saying, I got a badge, you know, actor normally coming in, and then this badge can be gopis today, but maybe tomorrow Sambit comes out, he can be able to do that. He's not even checking and all that. So that's exactly what's happening in the security world. All this zero trust and all this are cloud authentication happens based on something called platform, you know, something called root of trust. So it's kind of, I consider that as an ID for each platform. Unfortunately, that is become a default. Original earlier days, network site used to be the Mac, but this time it's a platform root of trust. And one, they've been you know, programmed wrong. And the other one is somebody stealing it or bypassing it, all kinds of combinations, you'll be able to do that. So it doesn't matter how big of a computing engine you put it on the top, if somebody already got the badge in and it's inside out, he can open the door he wanted. So in that particular place, you do need on the, on the edge, definitely. Every platform has to take care of itself. Just like Kavita talked about it also, all the computing, all the models enabled to. So the badge example I talked about, you don't need to know the platform will know you coming from the door, Gopi normally comes up whatever the time. So it profile build up already in a door number one and Gopi only comes up at this time of the time. And he walks in this way versus somebody, somebody coming as a Gopi doing it differently, different time, different things. So you can be able to complete anomaly detection, able to find, and at least you start with a double authentication to go and make sure that that is right. Video authentication, picture authentication, et cetera. And then that data goes to cloud to be able to do. So I can give another example and 
olden days, you had to get the operating system as Windows. You had to download or whatever. You put it into your CD drive and then install onto you, your laptop or PC. And then it goes to next to the Windows word and all that. What changed with Office 60, 365 is this more of a business model. Went to the cloud directly. Every time you turn on, it goes to authentication into the cloud for Microsoft server and gives you an authentication. But that changed a lot more. Now every session gets an authentication rather than a one-time authentication for your laptop. But I can tell you, what, what does it trust? It trusts your platform. It means that laptop is yours and laptop says it is what it is. And the same way the other side. I can, I can kill that whole process by simple way. Put a simple malware in the laptop, telling that every time our laptop is trying to go connect to something in a cloud server to get an authentication, I can tell it to go to a fake server and then always gives an authentication. So laptop thinks I got the authentication. The other way around, and now the cloud server thinks like my laptop is mine, but it's actually sandwiched. And it's always things that are given authentication. So both places, you need a security, you need an authentication to protect those. That's yeah. what we're doing, not just a fixer one, it's a behavior also. I don't think we see any company spending on money at this point. I think it's a hardware based, exactly what the edge AI need to work on a computer vision base. I think the security side also need to come in. I hope more companies and more innovations will come up. We're just a beginning on that part. No, excellent so, point. Uh, yeah, I just want to give a one. Okay, excellent point, Gopi. I'll tell you, I'm facing the same situation as you said about your grandfather. That, that there is a lot of old age population in India, uh, including my father also, and uh, they have, I have to do uh, things online. And yeah, but they don't feel secure. They don't feel secure. Yeah. So that's it. I'll go to Tusar. Tusar, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I'm really jealous of both of you that your grandfathers are around. Mine is not, <laughs> so <laughs> that's yeah. one thing. But second, Gopi, you brought a very interesting point. You talked about security for AI, and then for behavioral model, we needed AI for security. So it becomes a yes. loop which goes on and, on and on, which is a very interesting perspective. I'll bring a very different perspective. This is more from the software side. Uh, you all have, must have heard of something called GP2, GPT-3, GPT-2. These are very powerful artificial intelligence models for natural language processing being built by a company called OpenAI. The key point there is over a period of time when training these models becomes really tough and you know it requires a huge amount of compute, it will go more towards what is called utility model. Everybody does not produce power in their home. Similarly, every company will not be training models. We'll have pre-trained models like GPT-3, which, is, which Microsoft has licensed, and most of the people will basically use these pre-trained models to build on top of it. That's going to bring down the compute needs to a great extent. That's the reason me, you, Kaveta, Gopi, we do not have to buy, or Mohammed does not have to buy a generator and a turbine for our own homes. So that's the fundamental shift. The interesting thing is, remember, AI became so democratized and popular because of cloud computing. Let's not forget it. Cloud computing and AI paradigms have been always going together. Cloud computing made storage and compute cheap. That's why AI became so pervasive. I did my undergrad and master's thesis in AI 20 years back. Nobody was giving me a job in AI at that time. So same cloud computing will basically now come in form of pre-trained models, which will be owned by some of the bigger cloud providers. Others will basically be tying to it and leveraging that to build things on top of it. Now with edge becoming powerful, you can basically do that. And as a matter of fact, to continue Kavita's thought process, we won't even need to send this back to the cloud because that's a pre-trained model. We will download our own version of the model and work with our own applications going forward. And that will bring down the necessity of communicating back and forth. I'll have my own, because think about this. GPT-3, for example, is trained on everything which is on World Wide Web for natural language processing. I don't need to basically go and, you know, again, uh, improve that loop. My application may be only focused on retail or manufacturing or healthcare. I can take that model, develop something on top of it, work with the edge. That paradigm is really going to uh, move forward and people will be focusing a lot on developing AI applications, which are focused on their own needs. And they will be different for different uh, industries. That's the way, uh, that's another paradigm, which is basically a combination of pre-trained models with com cloud computed, Pre-trained yeah, pre models with cloud computing uh, with a lot more uh, specialized models developing on the edge. That's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, excellent, uh, Tusar. Uh, yes, this GPT-3 is uh, very exciting and, and hope it solves the, the, the compute capacity problem that uh, to some extent. 
And uh, Tushar, by the way, uh, uh, 30 years back, I did my master's thesis on neural networks. I also didn't get a job on neural networks. And now exactly, me too. Yeah, I, 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 was, I interviewed with Motorola in 99 and explained them my master's thesis in artificial intelligence pattern recognition. The guy listened to me and said, do you know multi-threaded programming in Java? Yeah. I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, Any other can, perspective? I yeah, I can add a little bit of color to what also uh, to add to what Tushar and uh, Gopi mentioned. The key thing, if you really look at the AI, it's a very interesting uh, area. The number of sensors, let's just take a look at the number of sensors. You have radars, you have lidars, you have cameras, you have depth cameras, you have 4D lidars now, you have all kinds of cameras, all kinds of sensors. And then you have all kinds of frameworks. Somebody says PyTor, somebody says MXNet, Onyx, you name it. There are all kinds of frameworks. Then there are all kinds of models that are getting generated. Some object detection, object classification, semantic segmentation. So if you, re and then the applications are all, uh, again, a computer vision application. Some of them are recommendation engines, NLP-based applications. So if you really think about it, it is a wide variety of variables that you're talking about. And now let's look at the edge devices, right? Blaze has its own product. We are creating our own, CMA is creating our own product. There are so many of these edge devices in the market today. So you train the model with your own framework. A data scientist has no idea what the hardware underneath it is. He used his best knowledge with his data and trained it. Now, how do you actually deploy it to for inference? That's why there are so many trained models. But when you look at the actual applications in the industries, not many companies are able to actually deploy it and get meaningful applications out there in the market. And also what I see is sometimes people think that ML is a solve all. It's a new terminology. AI is something cool on the blog. So we are doing AI. But what sometimes we fail to think is not everything is, AI is not the holy grail for all the problems. If you take computer vision, for example, there are certain functionalities like say Kalman filtering or Fourier transforms that are still best on DSPs. It's not good for machine learning or your neural networks. So how do you partition it? So the key where I believe uh, the investment needs to be made is in that infrastructure in figuring out how do you take it? Yeah. How do you make your so software stack so hardware agnostic that you can use the train models, you can customize it because your end application requires a completely different model than the trained model. So you have to tune it, you have to tune it for your applications. How do you create that seamless infrastructure and software stack where irrespective of what is done at the hardware level or all the sensor agnostic or the framework agnostic, you are able to take the pre-trained model and adopt it to your application and seamlessly get it deployed. So your development to deployment time cycle reduces. Only then we will see inference actually kicking off in a big way. And it's not there yet. It's going to take some time. It, it yeah. requires a paradigm shift. No, excellent points, Kavita. I, and I hope this auto ML terminology or this concept uh, will help. Definitely. In uh, some of these things, uh, uh, maybe we need some auto schedulers also. Okay. So, AI for AI. Let me yeah, yeah. Really give uh, a different yes. spin on, on this. So I'm, I'm going to put in my academic hat on this. So when I say investment, what would people would like to invest in 10 years, 20 years from now? So I think from, uh, I was put into three categories. One is actually on the application side. People need to look, work on and to generalize AI, right? Since right now, if you look at computer vision, CNN's got a massive boost right of that. And then GPT is not CNN anymore. It's a different model. So like people, and then there's DLRMs that's done by Facebook for recommendations. So they are all are different models, right? And it seems that the, it's just like, there's not a unified framework. I think if we can get with a unified framework for all of AI and that it could be spun off into like subsets of that, that would be a really like we reach the, like say the end target of AI. Then on the second side, I mean, we need a lot of investment. How can you make these models affordable from the hardware perspective such that you don't mean like the GPT-3 model, right? It's, it's billions, 180 gigabytes, right? Imagine if someone a couple of years down the road, hey, I managed to get this with one gigabyte. A couple of years later, I got it better with one megabyte, right? Yeah. So the innovation on how to make this model more compact, removing all the unnecessary fat in it, right? That is also another way that people would work with this. Finally, I think our, this is like a much longer route, the hardware itself that we're working on, it's still based on the idea that you get data, you do compute, you store data, you get data, do compute, and you store data. 
slowly, slowly we are shifting away from this, but I think the world of brain inspired computing and neuromorphic computing, right? This needs a massive, massive push because right now, I mean, while they show massive promise, it's extremely hard to get them integrated in any existing system, oh, okay. right? So yeah. this needs a massive work, a massive investment, so because they are can pr provide the closest thing that we know to how brain works to a certain degree, right? So so that when computer and memory are in intertwined together, you would be able to deploy really sophisticated model at a very low power budget with high performance. So. Excellent. So that's yes. a different perspective that I wanted to. Yeah, I have an excellent perspective, and I think to do these things, uh, I feel uh, that you talk about the framework. I think the industry and academics they have to collaborate better. Today, uh, you know, this uh, somewhat silo approach. Okay, I will be the winner. I don't think that will fly. I think we need to collaborate better. And the other piece of it is uh, yes, uh, the, I know there is research happening of how do we make a compute closer to the brain. It's not easy. But, so, yeah. Yeah, so if you see like I mean quantum computing got a massive push because industry started working on it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like we yeah. need the same thing, but more into the, well, into, into AI. Very good, very good. i uh, sorry, I'm just uh, losing a little track of time here with all these exciting viewpoints. Uh, but I just want to was, ask one final question. Uh, uh, Venkata, please uh, don't stop me here. No uh, problem, no problem, go ahead. <laughs> okay, is uh, before I go to any audience questions, if uh, there are anything critical. Uh, is uh, you know you know India is a is, has a vast technical talent. You know uh, we have been doing good in software for uh, many uh, thirty years or so, and uh, and there's a lot of excitement in India. A lot of excitement in the engineers, among the companies, the academics, and uh, even the government. I know. So uh, how do you think uh, uh, what kind of a role India can play in this whole evolving AI ecosystem, cloud edge? And what advice do you have for the uh, engineers, the uh, academicians, the government, the, the companies in India? Um, uh, we can start, anybody can. Uh... Right, so somebody there is a very interesting perspective. Hmm. Um, you know, certain areas where, when you think about AI, you have to think about applications. And some of the areas which needs huge amount of application development and model training are healthcare, financial services, retail, manufacturing. Healthcare is a very important area. The last speaker was talking about it. With the Western world, the challenge is because of the privacy rules and other stringent regulations, it's tough to get hold of data to train models. Yeah. Whether you want to do model training in software, you want to embed it in hardware, that's a separate question. But getting, getting you know, access to data itself is a challenge. India, with its vast number of population, with a more, little bit more relaxed regulatory regime, can be a great place for training some of these healthcare models and deploying them. Uh, kind of proving efficacy of different algorithms and become a forefront in solving some of the more technical challenges which Western world will not. And then these proven models can be taken to the Western world for you know training them on specialized pieces of data and stuff. So basically leveraging India as a place for training models uh, for high impact applications. And that will benefit India right away in terms of you know healthcare yeah. and other challenges that we have. That's one approach which I see where I see India can Play a big role, and accordingly, regulations, government, companies can basically go from yeah. there. Now, excellent point. Uh, India, of course, with its population, can generate huge amounts of data. That uh, you know, and uh, and the good thing is that the, the government is very, very supportive uh, of uh, the the AI revolution and the digital revolution uh, that kind of uh, that's happening as we speak. Any other perspectives uh, on uh, advice to people in India? I believe the India has a boatload of talent some bit that just the raw talent with regards to the engineers it produces and the technical talent. If we tap into it and the brain power that it's just going to generate, I think it's going to be huge for AI solving the problems for AI. That's one thing. Data sets to Tushar's point is really true. If you get the data sets for say autonomous driving, right? A car, if it can drive in, in India, it can drive anywhere else in the world. As simple yeah. as that, right? So <laughs> not just data that sets. That I agree with. <laughs> Even a person. Not just data sets, right? Even the testing of it, testing of the deployment of these solutions, if you test it in India, because corner case testing is going to be impossible. How do you test autonomous system will work exactly to your specific specifications in all scenarios? It requires a lot of validation and it's not easy to validate it. So if you test if the testing capabilities in India, it, I think it's gonna really help bringing autonomous or uh, making autonomous systems a reality. So India can yeah, play a huge role in all of this. Say, 
yeah, we'll invite uh, Elon Musk to do his testing in India. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a way to do it. Yeah. One one side I could say that uh, is a what you know country abundance of talents. What he talked about, we're just expanding it in Hyderabad. Around 20 people, we're going to hire in the next three months. The team is going to expand. One governments and all this is helping us. That would be one beneficial. Item number two is what we're talking about data sets. Security, we just talked about a grandfather thing, an example. I'll tell you, that is the biggest data point so we can collect how many ways people can make mistakes. And then that part of the security data sets, actually, some of the academy guys, you know, maybe the maybe uh, Dr. Mohammed in here can help on that too. Also, people working on not just computer vision only, but again, I'm preaching to the choir from this one too. People start focusing that there is a lot more data we can do. And this data is a lot more, you know, volume-wise bigger. Maybe the capacity size not as zettabytes, but the even number of events happening because network element is a smaller in a size compared to a picture. And but you have a lot more data need to be able to crunch. And all that examples and testing also what she's talked about, you know, field testing, allowing the governments and allowing that to also will make much better security. Yeah, I think there is a question for the panel. I just okay that uh, our Indians are expected due to testing only. I think uh, the <laughs> comments uh, was more for yeah. that. Okay, India has a great infrastructure for any uh, you know like the driverless cars to do do the AI testing. But India has lots of talent that can develop yeah. applications, technologies, lots of startups. I think we all we all said first is the talent is there, including yeah. Kavita said that too. Yeah, no Testing doubt. was generally because it's a complex environment, what she was uh, referring to, not anything discriminating is, I mean, that we all agree that, you know, there's complete chaos on the road and the streets and anywhere in the world. If, yeah. if you can drive in India, you can drive anywhere. It's same for the machine too. We are opening a branch in India yeah. too, see my opening, good. because just the brain power is, I yeah. think, is mm -hmm. enormous development, exactly. testing, any aspect Excellent. of AI. So, and and, 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 test, and, and testing in AI is not an isolated phenomenon. You have to first train the model. <laughs> the training will happen in India as well. So that yeah. certainly requires our people. Also, and it's my urge, uh, I, I, okay. I come to Muhammad, uh, just want to say is that uh, to right. all the India leaders and uh, engineers, is you take charge of your destiny. You have the talent, you have the brain, take charge of your destiny. Go ahead, <laughs> Mark, and we'll yeah, wrap so, I mean, like, I mean, it, it is like India the, has the richest engineering background. I mean, they go to be successful. I think that um, from what I'm seeing, observing globally, right, as AI na nationwide, everyone is having its own national strategy, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure that India has its own AI national strategy as well. Maybe the idea is that to focus on one particular field that India can excel in easily and very quickly. And then India becomes a world leader in a subfield of this, right? For example, AI in, in, in medicine, AI in agriculture, right? Now it's India's number one there. That yeah. automatically will, will bring in a catalyst on improving all other aspects of AI where India can easily become a competitor right with the words being top nation in this field. Yeah. Um, By the way, I just want to share some data. When I was in Qualcomm, we used to do 80% of uh, SOCs of Qualcomm in India. So just to give a perspective. And, yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. So excellent, uh, Venkata. I think, uh, I'm sorry, I probably run over time. No problem, no problem. When we are having an interesting discussion like this, we don't notice time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and I didn't feel like interrupting you either. No problem. I. Uh, but I think uh, really great discussions. I, I, I just want to summarize uh, and uh, uh, thank the panelists uh, for really a very lively discussion and ISA for really the opportunity. Uh, I think we concluded that we need both cloud and edge, but we need a lot of uh, innovations, uh, particularly the edge area, the, the security, ease of use, uh, framework, and uh, you know, uh, GPT-3 kind of thing. So, and India can play a big role. India can, has lots of talents, lots of uh, engineers, uh, and uh, a lot of support from the government. And uh, India can play a big role in development of this AI uh, infrastructure, AI uh, solutions. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's a great infrastructure to, to, to try out some of these applications, you know. So excellent uh, points. And uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, Venkata, uh, I think we should wrap up. Uh, really want to take this uh, occasion to thank all of you, the panelists, and all the audience uh, for patiently uh, listening to the comments. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so a lot, much. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, been thank a great you. education for our audience as well. I'm sure they're delighted to be part of this, uh, you know, uh,
panel discussion and and once again thank you all for taking the time to joining us it's been a wonderful uh, discussion and we look forward to having more of these discussions in the future thank you for the opportunity guys thank you thank you for the thank you. thank you so much thank you thank you so we will take a a, a quick